Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Call it Duty Modern Warfare is here, and so is Mountain Dew. Roger that. Now you can unlock in-game rewards like only Dew can. Wait. What rewards? A dual operator skin. Man, I love operator skins. Dual double XP, and even Call of Duty points. You're kidding me. Double XP and Call of Duty points? This is incredible. I can't believe it. This... Soldier, get a hold of yourself. Oh, roger that. Look for specially marked packaging and visit mtndugaming.com for details and restrictions. Open to U.S. residents 17 plus. Call of Duty points available on 12 and 24 packs and free 20 and 23. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome to Jumping Bomb Audio. Welcome back to Jumping Bomb Audio, the number one podcast all about the world of Joshi Pro Wrestling. My name is Taylor, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host and good friend Kelly. Kelly, we've reached the end of another year of wrestling. We did it. We we made it through, and I guess we're just going to start another one next year. Hopefully, as we always hope with the end of every year, hopefully next year will be even better than this year. Yep. Uh, but hopefully by the end of next year, I really have my fingers crossed and maybe I'll jinx the whole thing right now. I'm hoping next year at this same time when we're doing the year end reviews, we're saying, wow, isn't it great that early in 2023, every pro wrestling show allowed cheering? Uh, Taylor, I regret to inform you that you just created COVID-20. <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably did, but um, <laughs> that's my hope. I would love to host a podcast uh, about wrestling where wrestling is able to do full wrestling shows. That would be nice. It's uh, been nearly three years of doing this, and we're still doing this shit. So it's hard to believe. <laughs> Probably if you go back to like episode 10, I'm like, oh, I can't wait for cheering coming soon. And here we are, <laughs> episode 71. And still waiting. We've gotten some. Yep. Gotten some Tokyo Joshi shows and some other shows. But my fingers, I cannot cross my fingers any harder <laughs> that next year is the year. I believe. Yeah. You have to believe. Because what happen. else would you do? <laughs> I mean, I certainly hope. If it hasn't happened next year, it it will never happen. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Bef- so this episode is going to be our year in review episode. We're going to talk all our awards, all the categories, everything you want. Match of the year, wrestler of the year. And all the way down. But before we do that, we got to get in the plugs as always. Follow us on Twitter at JBomb Audio. You can follow Kelly at Comic Geek Kelly. And you can follow me at Tay Mambo. 
subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. And if that app of choice happens to be Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate if you gave us a five-star rating and review. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can donate to the show at redcircle.com slash shows slash jumping dash bomb dash audio. So let's get right into it. We're going to be doing the awards, but Kelly first. What were your thoughts on the year overall? It's weird. It's it's a year that like there's a lot of good. There's a lot of really good stuff. But also there isn't like that one crystallized match that'll just like this is a classic. It'll remain in my brain forever. And just I don't know. There this year they didn't there wasn't that moment. Where it was like, because last year I had the Chris Brooks Lulu pencil match, where it's like, yep, this is a classic. This is one of my favorite matches ever. I'll remember it till the day I die. This year there was a lot of great stuff that I went through my notes and I had zero recollection of, and I had to go back and rewatch for this. <laughs> so it's just, it it was a weird year overall, good, but I also forgot a ton of it. My strongest feeling personally, and I felt this in the middle of the year um, as well, so I sort of started feeling it partway through the year and then it didn't go away, was that I really felt, um, and I'm sort of spoiling generally some of our picks here, I very much struggled and frankly didn't succeed in finding things outside of the big two, I'll call them, which is stardom and Tokyo Joshi. I thought it was really a year and not really through the fault of stardom. It wasn't stardom or Tokyo Joshi sort of targeting, but it felt like a year where sort of that middle level, I'll call it, which I always thought of as like ice ribbon, And Seedling, you know, those type of promotions, Ice Ribbon was sort of the quasi number three, and they had a very tough year where it felt like they sort of dropped off the map. Uh, Seedling, who had had many years of sort of these very long, interesting storylines that were getting paid off, felt like they sort of struggled uh, with Nanai leaving and some injuries. So it really felt like that middle level disappeared to me. And it felt very much like stardom and Tokyo Joshi way up at the top and everything else very separated sort of in another place. I don't mean to say like at the bottom as if they're terrible, but in terms of the memorable things, you know, every, the last two years we've done this, I've always had some non-stardom and Tokyo Joshi matches make my top 10 and often very high. Last year I had the uh, Gaia uh, main event is my number one match of the year. This year I, there really was, there was a lot of good stuff, but nothing that cracked into that top level. Um, So I'm interested to see in 2023 if that continues or if maybe one of these smaller promotions can, you know, rise up a little, get some momentum going, and make a mark. Essentially. I also think a part of it is just time. Because there we covered a lot of stardom. There was a lot of shows. And I feel like it just didn't leave us time to watch a lot of other stuff. So it's just, we kind of just watched a ton of stardom and stuff. And then a lot of the stuff we'd have to go farther to seek out, or it's just like by the time we had time to watch it, it's like, fuck, I don't want to watch wrestling anymore. <laughs> I want to do literally anything else. Well, and I think part of it is like we just talked about this sort of crowd cheering as well uh crowd noise crowd levels in that even some stardom matches i've talked about on this show were affected by the fact that there was no cheering and we're talking about these 
sort of big matches and big venues with a lot of people. And then you're talking about, okay, you have that same effect sort of in a smaller venue. And so you're almost doubling the effect because then all of a sudden there's less people and it feels sort of these small shows can sometimes really be brought up by the crowd. The crowd is really into it. And then you're watching a show from, I don't know, Shinjuku face and no one's really making any sound. And it just all feels like, Oh, this is very small. Yeah. You know, one I, match. These past years have kind has really hurt Japanese crowds because they've just been conditioned to react in a certain way. Now it COVID turned cra- Japanese crowds into what Chris Jericho told everyone they were. Yeah. And it's, now that we're sort of getting the cheering crowds, I think that might also affect it because some will be cheering and some will be not. So you'll have to sort of do this switch between, oh, this is great. You know, the Tokyo Joshi All Rise show that we just covered had cheering and it's like a reminder of how good or how much crowds can elevate a match. And then you go to another show where there's no cheering and you're like, Oh, I just came from a show that had cheering. I sort of want that. Yeah. Um, and how valuable crowds are in taking matches from you're like, oh, I enjoy this into something that's like, wow, this is really great. Um, so we, uh, you know, we'll have to see. I don't know. I can't predict the future, certainly after the last three years. Uh, not even going to try to <laughs> predict the future, but. Uh, we'll see what happens, but let's get into the awards. Uh, we are going to start at the top, work our way down, and then finish with our top 10 matches of the year. So the first award is going to be, as it's called in the Wrestling Observer, the Flair Thez Award, which is for all-around, overall best wrestler in terms of in-ring, uh, drawing, and everything. So Kelly... Give us your top three wrestlers for the Flair Thez Award. Okay, so this award I always have a really hard time with just because I don't pay attention to numbers. Like, I who draws what, I, I don't care. That's just not part of what I like about wrestling. Like, the ratings discussions, I fucking, my eyes glaze over and I'm just like, wow, this is the last thing I care about. So it's like, I I just have a hard time with this one. So if you don't agree with what my picks are, that's fine. I probably don't really agree with mine either, but this is what I came up with. So uh, number three, we three, we got Yuka Sakazaki. Uh, Number two, we have Kyrie and number one, we have Siri. I I feel like I Siri's got to be at the top. She's been at the top of stardom pretty much all year. Uh, Kyrie felt like a game changer for stardom and especially kind of lit the fuse with the new Japan stuff and getting the IWGP title rolling. And then Yuka's just kind of like the stalwart of Tokyo Joshi. So like that, that was, that was my logic in picking those three. Yeah. I had a similar list. I went with, uh, at my number three, I went with starlight kid just because I thought that, Maybe not in terms of straight up drawing, but it felt like her sort of story was, um, you know, the turn and everything, all that happening was sort of a draw into the promotion, sort of it got buzz, I guess, to me. Um, You know, it's sort of hard to gauge these stardom attendance numbers in terms of in terms of saying oh, so-and-so is responsible for this big number. Like, it feels like when the matches are big, when it's like, hey, we have a lot of title matches, they draw better, which is less about, oh, it's so-and-so wrestling for the title. Yeah, so it's it like was you have so- a higher probability of these shows being good or these matches being good. Yeah, so I went with Starlight Kid number three just because I also thought she had a good year and I thought I'd uh, throw her a bone in a way. Number two, I went with Yuka Sakazaki, you know, had the um, 
had the tag title reign, had the top title, uh, the Princess of Princess. So I thought for a sort of growing promotion, she was very important uh, with multiple titles, multiple main events. Uh, so I went with her number two. And like Kelly, Shuri, number one. Um, I think pretty straightforward. She was main eventing most of, if not all, the top shows for stardom. Uh, having good matches, which is sort of the textbook definition, I think, of this award. So she was really the easy, easy number one pick. Kelly, I'm sort of with you in that I don't really care about drawing. You know, sometimes I'll look at the number and say, oh, interesting. It's up or down, but I don't really love getting into the sort of nitty gritty of like business things yeah it's it's just not what i care about because i think it really for me it comes down to my days my early days of like wrestling forums when i was the huge like ring of honor fan and then people would be like well ring of honor sucks because they don't draw they don't have as many fans at their shows as wwe they're clearly the best company and it's like fuck God damn it. It's not. Ah! and that just comes out in the back of my head where it's just like you know what fuck these numbers they don't matter because they don't yeah ring of honor is the uh a great example of something that was very good and never did anything yeah uh so yes oh because they they didn't do uh john cena wasn't there john cena's the the biggest name in wrestling he's the best wrestler yeah, sorry, stu- I have you a stupid robot. I have a car honking in the background. Can you hear that? No. <laughs> okay, good. Is it in uh, your house? Did, did it is it did it bust in? No, it's not in my house, but I can hear it. It's I think it's a car alarm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going off. Um So sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> well, that I think that the that's better than like if a goose was in your house and was honking. Uh, sure. I aren't goose, aren't geese, aren't goose, aren't geese very aggressive animals. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, if that happened, I would not want you to cut that from the show. I would want the audio of you having to fight the goose in this. <laughs> well, episode. There is no, as far as I'm aware, I'm only in one room of my uh, apartment, but I don't believe there is a goose in my Okay, apartment good. at the moment just the car alarm going off outside what would your strategy be for fighting a goose for fighting a goose i would probably yeah. just open my front door and be like please <laughs> please see you later so I, you gotta uh, you gotta grab it by the neck and start swinging it around like it's a flail and... no because then you have to reach <laughs> your hand to the neck and i think it would bite you yeah um, you got to take the risk because th- I think the... I would like put on a coat and put on gloves first. There you so go. I would have yes. some form of protection um, and then maybe a hat to sort of protect my face a little bit. Yeah, I would definitely like I would I would fight a goose. I would never fight a turkey. I think a turkey would be I don't know. Turkeys are scary. I think a turkey dude. would be easier than a goose. No, turkeys are scary and they've got talons. Oh, that is true. I didn't think about that. And like they will full on chase you. Interesting. Like every yeah, every now and then much... we do have to worry about just roving turkeys in my neighborhood. That's very interesting. I've never had to worry about a roving turkey. Uh <laughs> where i live uh but anyway <laughs> that that is the conclusion of our flair Thess award winners <laughs> uh so next we'll move on to most outstanding which is just in ring work for the year so kelly i will let you go first again all right so my number three is suzu suzuki uh really just had a great year i thought I've been loving all of her stuff in prominence, especially her recent um, Deathmatch trial series she's been doing. Those have all been great. And she did a lot of cool stuff in Stardom, too. So I thought Suzu, while she didn't really have like the super high-end stuff that she had in prior years, I think overall she had a really s- strong year. 
Uh, number two is Yuka Sakazaki. Uh, between her tag title run and now being champion in Tokyo Joshi, she's just had a great year all around and is in one of uh, my number th- my top three matches. I'm not going to spoil which one, but she had a really, really good match that I love this year. And then my number one, someone who I think really is kind of a dark horse for having just a great year. And I didn't really think about it at all until I was laying out this ballot and looking at it. Asuka. Asuka had a tremendous year. She had some really good high-end matches. Uh, She did a lot of great stuff in DDT, especially this year. She had a great uh, tag title run with Mao. Uh, She was in that mixed tag uh, opposite Jun Akiyama. That was really cool. And just overall, you get an Asuka match, you know it's going to be great. So yeah, she stood out the most to me when I was kind of going through my notes for the year. So number one most outstanding was Asuka. Well, we have two totally different lists here, which is very exciting. I went, number three, I went Shuri. As I said, she was my number one on Fleur Thez. She had a good, in a great in-ring year uh, with lots of opportunities, main eventing a lot of these shows. My number two, I went with Miyu Yamashita, uh, which is always one of those, I was sort of putting together these lists and I was like, okay, who do I want to put on? Uh, and then you sort of look at, Miyu's year and it's like once again she had a fantastic year um, which you'll hear more about later in the show sort of the feeling of the same feeling when Io Shirai was around in stardom um, a number of years ago and used to always get like number eight in the Wrestling Observer most outstanding rankings and it was always like oh are people just sort of voting her because she's a notable joshi wrestler and then you would go back and be like no she had a number of great matches and it's sort of one of those things where you sort of take it for granted you're like yeah she'll be good and you so you don't really think about it until the end of the year where you're looking at or i'm looking at my matches and being like yeah there's a number of very good miyu matches on here an oppressive amount. So I thought she should make the list. And my number one, got to give it to Azumi. Uh, My favorite wrestler of the year had a great year with the high speed title. I mean, I think every month went out on the big stardom shows and had a high quality match highlighted by some big, uh, big matches, which we'll talk about as we're running up our match of the year list, but she was my, that was the easy one. I sort of was like, okay, I know Azumi will be number one. Who is two and three? Uh, So I am giving it to Azumi for most outstanding. So that is our most outstanding six wrestlers there, which is hard to believe. Usually we have at least one uh, crossover vote. Yeah, no, that was kind of surprising. But just speaks to a lot of good wrestlers out there having good years. The next award is Tag Team of the Year. I'll kick off this one to I will upset Kelly um, (laughs) with this one. I went number three. I went the Meltier team, uh, a team I know Kelly is very anti. I don't like them. Uh, But just felt like, I don't know if it's really, it's sort of like tag team of the year, even though their actual tag team work, I'm not like, ah, they blew it away. But they felt sort of like two big parts of stardom. And the logical conclusion was putting them together. And so they feel like a big deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like they felt it's it's more like, oh, they were very notable less than, oh, they had X, Y, Z number of great matches. They just feel like an important if you're telling the story of 2022 and Joshi, I think Meltier is a big part of that story. That's a that's a better way to put it. Um, my number two, Kelly touched on it brief, briefly, but I went with the magical sugar rabbits, uh, tag champions for 
the majority of the year and one of the, I think, most consistent teams uh, in all of Joshi in terms of, you know, when they wrestle, you're probably getting a good match. You're probably getting it in the main event or semi-main event. And they deliver time and time again. So they were an easy uh, number two. Feels a little bit like Miyu, where it feels a little um, like hack. I was like, oh, I'll put the Magical Sugar Rabbits. And I'm like, well, that's sort of hack. I feel like they're always on these lists of Tag Team of the Year, but they're always on the list because they're good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my number one was the FWC team of Hazuki and Koguma. Really, I thought in the beginning of the year, I mean, held it for a number of months, but certainly in the beginning of the year, sort of stabilized the stardom tag division that had sort of been uh, a little loosey-goosey and had great matches. So they, to me, um, and probably still my favorite tag team in stardom, so they, to me, were an easy number one. Kelly, who were your three tag teams of the year? Uh, so number three, I went with 1 to 1 million, uh, the team of Maki Ito and Miyu Yamashita. Uh, they didn't really have like any just blow away super great matches this year, but like I don't know. I just really like that team. I think they're fun, and you're going to get a good match out of them. Uh, number two, I went with Hazuki and Koguma. They really just held down things in the stardom tag division. And again, another team where you're just like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. You just pretty much guaranteed a great match out of those two. And then number one, the Magical Sugar Rabbits. Uh, pro- maybe my best, my favorite tag team in like all of wrestling. Just love those two, love their chemistry, and they're they're just great. They're going to have a good match every time out. And they, I thought they had a great tag title run. So yeah, those are, those are my three tag teams of the year. The next award is promotion of the year. And I will let Kelly go first to take all the heat before I swoop in and get away scot-free. All right. Uh, number three, stardom, uh, stardom. I don't know. I don't like them half the time. But like they had a lot of good matches this year and a lot of decent shows. So number th- they, they, they get my number three spot. Uh, number two is Prominence. I've really enjoyed their stuff this year. The shows are always fun and easy to watch and breezy, and you're usually going to get a really good main event out of them. So big, big fan of the Prominence stuff. And then uh, number one, we got Tokyo Joshi. I love Tokyo Joshi. Like the the shows again, even if they don't deliver like on a high end, they're always fun. I never feel like I'm slogging through them. It's just they have they have such a good energy to them, and they've got good crowds for the most part. So like I I will always enjoy watching a Tokyo Joshi show. So that's that's why they're in my number one spot. All right, Taylor, take take away, t- take it away, get all the roses. Yeah. So, I mean, frankly, I talked about this at the beginning of the show when we were talking the year overall, but really it felt like a stardom Tokyo Joshi year to me. So number three for this was, frankly, a struggle. I thought about putting Sendai Girls because I liked a lot of what Sendai Girls did, even though it was sort of very infrequent um, in terms of delivering sort of the bigger shows that made me go, oh, wow. You know, they had the show in July and then the show um, a few weeks ago that I thought were really great. I thought about them. I didn't include them. I actually (laughs) included a promotion that I haven't watched this year, but um, (laughs) which is sort of weird, uh, but feels like it's been getting a lot of buzz. And I have made a pledge to catch up, which is Actress Girls. Um, Actress Girls last year. Uh, quote unquote, shut down to not do wrestling. And then it turned out in February, they just started doing wrestling again, uh, which I thought was sort of the acting wrestling that's been happening. But it turns out it's just actual wrestling Uh, and it's gotten a lot of buzz and a lot of people are very excited about it. If you go to the Voices of Wrestling Discord, uh, there's always talk going on about actress girls. So I thought you know, there's always usually one promotion that sort of gets a little bit of buzz. I thought that was Actress Girls, but 
could have easily also put Sendai Girls in this spot. My number two uh, was Tokyo Joshi, a great year for Tokyo Joshi. Probably could have been number one, uh, but I'd like to see some, as we always talk about on the show, I'd like to see some different faces at the top of the card, which hasn't happened yet. I think if they would have pulled the trigger on one of them, I might have been tempted to put them number one, but that's sort of the fatal flaw that I'm holding out on uh, with them. And then my number one was stardom. Um, You know, anyone who listens to this podcast knows that, um, you know, I certainly don't think stardom is a uh, flawless promotion with no issues. Um, But sort of looking back at the year overall, uh, I mean, they ran a high number and we'll see this in some other upcoming categories, they ran a high number of excellent shows. They feel like a big deal promotion. They they grew another year. They now have the IWGP women's title and things like that. They ran some very big shows. I think personally, I'd like to see them still sort of tighten up the running schedule. It still feels from time to time like they are running shows Uh, purely for business reasons, which is probably why they're running all their shows. And people are going to say, well, it's a business, you know, they're trying to make money. I understand that. But there's just times when I'm like, oh, it's another show. Why is this show happening? Uh, Because they need to fulfill, they want to run here. It feels like when they build to a big show, those shows always deliver. And they have a super talented roster. So to me, they were an easy number one, even though I do have my qualms with them uh, from time to time. The next award is going to be Feud of the Year, a category I always struggle with. um, And Kelly really picked a good one. uh, So I will let him go first. This is one I really struggled with trying to pick because I... I really couldn't think of any that I thought were great this year. And I ended up going with Julia versus Suzu Suzuki because it's kind of just been boiling in the background throughout a good chunk of the year. And it's like, we haven't gotten a conclusion to it or anything, but I really liked what they did with it. I liked how they brought in like the real life feelings and stuff to it. Uh, And those two have such great chemistry. So all the Donna Del Mundo versus prominent stuff really landed for me. So, and I think it just connected on a level for the feuds that I don't really think anything else did for me this year. So that's why I ended up on Julia versus Suzu Suzuki. I went with Tom Nakano versus Natsupoi as mine. I talked about it before. It felt like the big deal storyline or one of the big deal storylines of the stardom year. I mean, I think the thing to me is always that in my mind, sort of the way I think of Feud of the Year is I'm like, okay, it's something that has to have, you know, lasted for six months. Just because that's the way I think of it, even though so few feuds happen over that long span of time. And I'm talking about like in all of wrestling, I always struggle with this category. Because I always think of like, oh, a great feud is one that lasts many matches and back and forth. And I, I, there really aren't that many examples anywhere of things that happen for such a long span of time to sort of satisfy that weird criteria I have. And Tom and Natsupoi was the only one I could even think of. Although Julia and Suzu is, I think, also a good pick, even though... It feels like it hasn't ended yet. So it's sort of weird to be like, this is a great feud, but it's not over. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, I was really debating about whether or not I would go with that. Because I'm like, who else is even a contender? Yeah. Tam versus Natsuboy was up there for me, but I hate how the story ended so much. (laughs) Because I'm like, in Tokyo Joshi, there was 
Yuka Sakazaki versus the Young Wrestlers shit. Well, and I thought about one of those, you know, like I always do. And I'm like, oh, you know, stardom not booking time limit draws is the feud of the year. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be serious. This is a very serious podcast. And we have to treat it with respect. So I won't be making any of those jokey answers. <laughs> no jokes he says here. As, yeah, he says in about five categories when I do a weird thing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just always a category it's it's less of an indictment of the wrestling and more of an indictment of my brain just doesn't can never wrap my head around this category. Yeah. Um it's one that always someone else throws something out and I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's a great one," like Julia Suzu Suzuki that I would my brain just would have never allowed me to think about. So anyway, let's move on to a category where I do understand the prompt. And that <laughs> category is most improved. Uh, Kelly and I have two different answers here. My vote was for Mina Shirakawa. Um, I thought very much improved in the ring this year. I think there's a lot of contenders for this category. Probably could have picked a number of wrestlers. I think also Suzume probably would have been up there. Ooh, that yeah, that's a good pull. Me. Um but Kelly, who did you choose? I went with uh Miyu Watanabe because she she's always she's been good for a long for a long while now, but it feels like the puzzle pieces kinda really started to fit together this year and she really started to perform at a higher level. It feels to me like you could pick any one of about eight Tokyo Joshi wrestlers and I'd be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Hikari Noah, Miyu, Suzume, Riso Endo could be one yep. that you could probably make an argument for. Harun and Echo. Har- yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> there's a yeah, yeah improved from. Avoid at all costs to this might be good. Yeah. Uh, which is an improvement. She's improved a ton. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and even in stardom, I think, you know, Mina, you could argue for, but I think there's yes, a number of sure. people you could probably make an argument for. It's sort of a wide open category where I think any one of many picks is right. Um, Mina went from a a good comedy wrestler to someone who can go out there and have like a legit, really good match. Yeah, uh, she's most improved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, she she that was a good pull. I didn't I didn't think of her, but yeah, no, she's she's right up there. Yeah, and it's funny to me because I didn't think of Miyu just because I guess I have always thought of Miyu as even when she didn't really, she wasn't any sort of focus. I always thought like, Oh, she'll be very good one day. So I guess it's an improvement where I'm like, of course she's gotten better because I thought she would. Yeah. Um, It's like a surprising improvement over an expected improvement. And in my mind, I just think, okay, most improved is like, who was I most shocked by got better. (laughs) And that was Mina, but Miyu is a good pick as well. The next category is most charismatic. And once again, Kelly and I have two different picks. My pick uh, is Unagi Sayaka. I just think she's a lot of fun. I don't know. Is she most charismatic? I mean, she is charismatic. Uh, but I just think she's sort of goofy and weird, and I enjoy watching her. Um, and I think she could also be someone in the uh, most improved running as well. Definitely. Uh, so I enjoy her in the ring, but also out of the ring. Uh, I think she's a lot of fun. So she was my pick. Kelly, it looks like you have flouted the rules here. I know. And chosen two wrestlers. <laughs> I couldn't pick. I, I had two. I went with Asuka and Starlight Kid. Uh, Starlight Kid, I would almost put as most improved most charismatic because this the the heel turn really just unlocked something in her where she is just 
just, she's super charismatic. She's just, she's get gets the crowd into the matches. She's always doing something like she's great. Like it's, it was one of those where it's like, oh wow, this has been here this whole time, hasn't it? And then Asuka's just Asuka. She's fucking great. Like just super easy to get the crowd into a match and all that kind of stuff. Only, only two categories after I said this was a very serious award show. I know. And you pull this. <sighs> I'm sorry. If you had I... to pick one, pick one. Uh, Starlight Kid. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> That's fine. Um, But another one where I think there would be probably a lot of, I mean, like Julia, of course. Oh, yeah. Can always do it. I mean, Tom has a charisma. I know that you've been anti a lot of that, but. She's very charismatic. I like Tom on her own. I just, I, whatever reason, Mel Tear just rubs me the wrong way. I don't like it. I don't like the entrance. I don't like that they're friends now. Just the whole thing. Don't like it. I like, bo- I like both of them a lot separately. Together? No. Mm-mm. Take those All stupid right. crowns off. Well, Kelly, we've been doing a lot of disagreeing, so let's do some agreeing in this next Yay. category. Uh, the category Best Technical Wrestler. Uh, and Kelly and I have the same pick. Spoilers. Kelly, you want to say who we both picked? It's uh, it's exactly who you think it's going to be. It's Siri. Like, what other option is there, <laughs> you know? I mean, really, is... I mean, Chihiro Hashimoto... Maybe, but not really. Yeah, like I, I don't. There's no one you can put up against Siri in this category and be like, and even really have it be like a tough decision. Uh, what about um, Palm Harajuku? Oh God! All right, changing my answer. It's Palm. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, is there really even anyone? I'm sort of trying to run down. I can't even think of anyone. No. So that's that. It's Yuri. (laughs) Uh, And speaking of agreeing, best brawler. Kelly and I both picking Suzu Suzuki. Although I think you probably could get a couple of other nominees in here but i think it was suzu i think she got a bigger platform with the stardom stuff and the prominent stuff and just feels like the logical answer yeah i i think another option would be julia i think she's uh i i don't i think a lot of people don't really think of her as a brawler but she 100 percent is and is very good at that style so she, I think she's a, a number two for me. But Suzu had a great year. Um, like I mentioned before, her deathmatch series in prominence has been great. She's been having awesome matches against some of the top stars in deathmatch wrestling. Yeah, it feels to me a bit going through these awards. I didn't have Julia for anything. Yeah, I, I, I kind of part of that her. is it feels sort of like Julia's year is next year. Yes. I mean, I think, I don't know that anyone would disagree with me. I think she's going to beat Suri and become champion, and that's probably going to be her year, 2023, will be her year. Because as we've seen, uh, once you win the title in stardom, you hold it for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, she, it, next year is her year. So it just feels like she had a good year, but it feels like a preparation year where it wasn't like, ah, she's the best of the year, but it feels like she was good to lead to something else, which will be in the future. Yeah. Best flying wrestler. Kelly and I picked differently, although closely related. I'm surprised we don't have the same answer on this. Well, I have a reasoning for mine, and I'll let you go first. Okay, so best flying wrestler is Azumi for me. Uh, her high speed title run has been incredible, and yeah, she's so good at that style. She's she's one of the best wrestlers in the world, uh, and she doesn't really get the credit for it. I don't think, but yeah, she's easily one of the best and is the best flying wrestler to me. 
I went with Starlight Kid only because Azumi is a good pick. I could have picked Azumi, but it felt like I gave Azumi number one in most outstanding. So I was like, there's your plaudits, your okay, awards. That's, that's understandable. And I felt like Starlight Kid did have a big year. So I was like, well, I'll give it to Starlight Kid because she was also very good. I mean, I think they're sort of the only two contenders. I mean, I guess like Yuka Sakazaki would be a contender. Yeah. Um, Asuka. She's kind of leaned know, yes. more into like uh, a hard hitting style. Than... Yeah. But I'm talking like there aren't that many contenders. So if you wanted to sort of like fudge it. Yeah. You might be able to be like, oh, Yuka or Asuka or. I don't even that's all I have. <laughs> um but yeah i did starlight kid mostly because i wanted to give her some more another nod because i think she had a really strong year i think she was one of the highlights of stardom so wanted to recognize her again for her excellence the ne- here we go the next category <laughs> is uh the wrestling observer category most overrated, which in terms of the wrestling observer means most over pushed. And I will give the listening, the long time listening audience a few seconds to shout out the name that both Kelly and I picked. Cause I think it's going to be very obvious. Yeah. Who we picked. And I know how strongly how very, very strongly Kelly feels about this person. So I will let him announce the quote unquote winner of this category. The number one undisputed, most overrated from the jumping bomb audio Joshi pro wrestling awards in 2022 is Saya Kamatani. Uh, why, why is she being pushed so hard? I don't understand it. It feels like, Finally, she's being told, hey, maybe dial it back a little bit because you busted up Mina's face and maybe you should stop trying to do all this dangerous shit that you can't really do. So maybe we'll finally see an end of her reign of terror. Uh, if you want to hear both of us kind of go off more, just listen to like the past two episodes. But, <laughs> but yeah, Saya most overrated slash overpushed by a wide margin. Yeah, she was the only person I even thought of. Um, A category I usually struggle with. I think the last two years I have struggled with even naming someone. Uh, But felt easy this year. You know, I'm sure we will get the argument that everyone loves her and they come to the shows to see her. But I think that, and in the feud of the year, speaking of the jokey picks that I didn't make, uh, a feud of the year could have been me versus the growing dread that Sayakamatani is going to fatally injure someone in a match. Yeah, uh, uh, Sayakamatani versus the Phoenix Splash. <laughs> I just think, you know, she has talent, but she's been pushed. I don't know why I'm even saying this. This is just like repeating the things we've said in the last two weeks. But I just think in a too high position and has sort of been crystallized into her stuff earlier than she should have been. Sayakamatani don't do two apron bumps challenge. I mean other contenders are I don't even know. Um I don't know. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> like I said, I always struggle This holiday season, Peloton's got a gift for you. Get up to $400 off Peloton Bike, Bike Plus, or Tread Packages. Choose the package that's right for you with accessories like our cycling shoes, a heart rate band, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. Peloton, fitness that stays with you. This limited time offer ends December 25th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer ends December 25th, 2022. Excludes Bike, Bike Plus, and Tread Basics. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. 
Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one one twenty three. Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. The JCPenney Mystery Sale is back for the holidays. Through Thursday, usher in huge holiday savings with our in-store coupon giveaway. You can get an extra 30, 40, or even 50% off while they last. Simply find an associate for a coupon, then peel to reveal your deal. Hurry in now to discover the savings you've been wishing for. We got your holiday. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 1215. Exclusion supply. Giveaway in-store only. Must be 18 years or older. See store for details. But this category, I ended up with one, so I can award it, and I can't think of anyone else. Now, on the flip side, we have most underrated, which also could be called underpushed. Uh, an interesting answer here from Kelly. Kelly, your pick for most underrated. Uh, I went Starlight Kid. I really do think, much like Azumi, she's one of the best wrestlers in stardom. Uh, I think 100% she should have been the person to take the title off of Saya uh, in their match earlier this year. And yeah, I think she just doesn't get her due. I think she's got hopefully a lot of success coming her way in the coming years. But I think really with this year when she really started to put things together, I think I think now was the time and I don't think they really gave her what she should have gotten. Kelly, I'm going to say very interestingly that I disagree with you on this oh. um, award. I guess I do agree with you that she probably should have, but that was early on enough that she probably should have dethroned Saya. But I think that was early on enough that it sort of, I think would have felt like, I don't know. It's sort of hindsight is 2020 in that now I feel like the Saya thing has gone on too long, but I think if Starlight Kid would have won, it would have felt like it went too short. Yeah. And we wouldn't have known that obviously all of these wacky things would happen and we'd become <laughs> incensed. Uh, and it feels like she got a lot of buzz. She got the turn. Like sort of the turn represented the push, even though mm -hmm. at the end of the year, she's not really in any super strong position. Um, and I think next year will be the interesting year. Like if she's in the same position in one year's time, when we're doing these awards, uh, in December of 2023, I think then I would agree with you, but I think she has been elevated to a level where she feels important and she hasn't gotten to that typical stardom level yet where it just feels like she's hanging around doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I, in all honesty, I fully expect to have her as my most underrated next year as well. Like to me, she doesn't feel like a Micah yet who is someone who just seems to like hang around. Yeah. As a number. Well, it's time for a title shot. All right, let's go. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, I would assume, I would, ho I would hope that someone's got to take the title off of uh, Saya at some point in the next year. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if Saya has the title a year from now. Something's going on. Um, so yeah, so I'll say I disagree, but you could be right. In a year, if if it's still happening, I'll come back on the show and, and say that you were correct. All right, hang on. Let me write that down in the <laughs> notebook here. <laughs> it's my, my list of uh, victory laps yeah. that I, I have waiting victory for Victory laps and grievances to air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my pick for most underrated was Mizuki. Uh, you know, had a tag title run as Magical Sugar Rabbits has had many times. But to me, Mizuki is easily at the top level and yet has not won the title. 
and it feels like it's been building for many years and i just need it to ha- it's just got to happen pull the trigger please yeah uh so mizuki i think there's probably some other people who you could make the argument for like maki ito but maki ito doesn't feel like she's under pushed because she's very popular <laughs> and everyone loves her and she sort of feels a little bit more teflon than mizuki um but i'm hoping 2023 so here's the thing we may come back in a year from now and we may have the same picks because if mizuki doesn't win the title i'll put mizuki again (laughs) and if starlight kid doesn't win a title you'll put starlight kid yeah entirely possible and we'll have the same ones but hopefully not hopefully in a year's time we're talking about top champions mizuki and starlight kid that would be great that would be nice Could anyone argue that that wouldn't be two deserving and very talented champions? I don't think so. (laughs) The next award was Rookie of the Year. Uh, I only had one thought, and that was Jury Nagano. Yeah, it's easy. Like, (laughs) 100% the best Rookie of the Year for sure. Though I know there are options in Actress Girls. I only saw one show of theirs this year, and a lot of their new talent is very, very good. But I did not watch enough to make that full judgment on them. And I'm really, I really do want to go back and watch some Actress Girls stuff. So it's it's Juria with an asterisk, but I still feel incredibly confident in my choice with her. So it sounds like we both have a pledge for 2023 to watch and catch up with Actress Girls. Yes. uh, Which hopefully we can do. Yeah, I was trying to think like Miyu Amasaki would be a contender, but I wouldn't choose her. No. Um, There are probably some other people I'm forgetting, but I can't I think even really Miyu think of Miyu Yatsuba anyone. from uh, Choco Pro slash Gato Move looks very good. Uh, I wouldn't put her above Juria at this point, though. Uh, but I think she's got a strong 2023 ahead of her. So she would. She's Mia is probably my number two. Did Chen Yoda debut in this year? Is she a contender? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know if she's been around prior, but I think I don't she know might be her, from this year. I don't know what her exact debut date is. Let me look it up. Yeah, because she, she could be in there Oh, no, sure. doesn't count. Doesn't count. September nope. of 2021. Ah. Really? That's a lot earlier. She had three matches in 2021. She had one in September... One in November and one in December. Okay, that's probably just whenever PPP runs a show. It was two PPP shows and a battle royal at the Makoto debut 15th anniversary show. Oh, okay. So, doesn't count. Uh, I think November is the cutoff or something. Um, So yeah, Juria, we're in agreement. The next category is best major show. Kelly, why don't we alternate on this one? Okay. Uh, Just for some fun. So you go first with your number three pick. All right. My number three pick, I went with Stardom World Climax Night 2, The Top, from uh, March 27th. Uh, This show, once I looked back on my notes, had uh, four matches that I went four stars or higher on uh, with Kyrie versus... Starlight Kid, uh, Dan Del Mundo versus Prominence Match, uh, Saya Kamatani versus Tom Nakano, and Siri versus Mayu Iwatani. So it was just overall a really strong card on this one. Well, funny enough, I went with Stardom World Climax Night 1 <laughs> from the day before... I have sort of the same thoughts. I thought it was a really strong show. I really enjoyed the prominence match. There was a good tag title match on that show. The return, the first match back of Kyrie, and then the Julia Shuri 
uh, main event, which I really enjoyed. So that was a very strong show, a number of very good uh, picks. So two, uh, two good shows back to back. You picked one and I picked the other. So Kelly, what is your number two? Did I distract you by what I was typing? Yes, you did distract me. If you could tell, <laughs> Kelly is typing. <laughs> Kelly is typing notes um, for a, for an additional award, which I'm sure everyone is looking forward to in our notes as I'm speaking, <laughs> uh, and I'm looking directly at them. Uh, so, Kelly, what's your number two best major show of the year? Uh, my number two was Senjo Chronicles from Sendai Girls on uh, July 10th, 2022. I don't know why I said the year. Of course, it was 2022. Uh, this match w- or this show was had a really had a good undercard, but was really held up by its top two, which was Dash Chisako versus Suzu Suzuki in a hardcore match. And then for the title, Chihiro Hashimoto versus Asuka. Uh, two really, really good matches that i i loved so that ended up giving this show the number two best major show my number two show of the year was tokyo joshi summer sun princess from july 9th of this year a uh, show i really enjoyed i think the best of the big Uh, Tokyo Joshi shows from this year. Um, Very strong up and down. That was the show with Maki Ito and Alex Windsor. That was the show with um, Shoko Nakajima and Rika Tatsumi. That was the show with uh, the first of the Ryu Mizunami challenge matches i'll just call them so a lot of strong uh very good matches on that show and on that note kelly what is your number one show of the year uh my number one show of the year is summer sun princess 22 (laughs) from tokyo joshi pro uh i love the big tokyo joshi shows like i think they're just paced very well i really just i love how they put together shows. So pretty much no matter what my number one was going to be one of their big shows. And this was my favorite of them. I thought the matches really delivered. I thought Windsor versus Ito was really good. Mizunami versus Miyu was great. Uh, Akai and Arai defeating the rabbits for the tag titles. And then Shoko versus Rika to close out the show was great. So yeah, my number one for sure. Again, I love these big Tokyo Joshi shows. And my number one show of the year was Stardom's Fight to the Top from June 26, just a few weeks before Summer Sun Princess. Uh, That show, I had four matches at four stars and above, Himika and Mina Shirakawa, the artist title match from that show, the main event, which was the six-person tag, and then, of course the Tom Nakano Natsupoi cage match to top it all off in the semi main event, both the semi main and main event were those uh, cage matches. So that an excellent show um, and my top show of the year. The next category I will go first on the category is best booker. And my answer was no one. Although yeah, Kelly, you fair. have a you have a solid answer. You have a solid answer. I I struggled with this. I really did, and then I eventually realized, like, oh, well, this works. Uh, I went with Dash Chisako, uh, the Booker of Sendai Girls, because she really turned a pretty stagnant promotion around into a show that has a lot of, uh, or into a company that has a lot of shows that are worth watching. So I think uh, Dash is really the only person I could think of that hasn't made incredibly weird booking decisions that I don't like. Yeah, I think that is, I didn't even really think of that, but I think that is a good 
choice. I would not have picked Stardom. Uh, I would not have picked Tokyo Joshi. Oh. Um, so my options were uh, limited. A lot of the smaller promotions. Um, it's like there's less sort of long term stuff going on there, so it's hard to be like, ah, you booked a good show. That is booking. Yeah. Um. But just being like, ah, put cool people together, and I do think Dash does deserve it. Um, you are totally right. Sendai Girls was probably one of the most, if not the most, stagnant Joshi promotion around uh, under the previous Booker. Um, and I think Dash has done a lot to lift it up, especially in the second half of the year and make it more exciting, have fun matches, sort of work to people's strengths and sort of normalize a lot of the booking, which was very strangely done for many years, as many people are very uh, aware of. Yeah, this so was the... this a year for booking that was just not great. Like, I I really wish that Emi Sakura would book uh, Gotta Move more often instead of what I assume to be Masa Takanashi, because that the that promotion has fallen off in a way that makes me very sad because they still do have good shows they still have good wrestlers but the booking is just not there anymore they just kind of make matches and there aren't the long-term stories being told anymore for the most part yeah and i think that's the case with with a number of i mean we talked about seedling seedling used to be very well booked in terms of those longer term storylines. They didn't really have that um, this year, really. They had some of it, but not in the way, you know, they had it in years past where they led up to the big um, hair match that got all those, uh, all that recognition and all those awards. It wasn't really happening that year. And Ice Ribbon, uh, sort of struggled. They were sort of handcuffed by people leaving and a lot of things sort of being knocked off the path. So it's hard to give them as well, which is why I struggled to think of anyone. It feels like a lot of the uh, more like indie promotions for Joshi are starting to book like the American indie scene where they're just like, hey, let's let's get matches that get people send in the... Uh, the take my money gif rather than building stories <laughs> though. I will say uh, I've heard nothing but great things about the booking of actress girls. So that's again, a blind spot for both of us that I'm sure might've ended up as our best booker possibly again. We'll find out next year. Maybe next year actress girls. Once we catch up, we'll run every single one of these awards. Who knows? Maybe who's to say. But the next and quote unquote final category is our top 10 matches of the year. So we will start at 10, alternating all the way up to number one. So I will start with my number 10 match, Suri versus Julia. I mentioned it already from Stardom World Climax Night 1 on March 26th. A great hard hitting match. And good news, if you also enjoy this match, or if you watch it and you enjoy it, we've got another one coming up soon. All right. Uh, my number 10 match is something that I really thought about going with for one of my favorite shows of the year, but I couldn't justify calling it a major show. So it ended up at my number 10. Uh, this is the Risa Sarah 10th Anniversary Iron Woman Deathmatch Gauntlet from Prominence Gaida and Risa Sarah debut 10th Anniversary from November 14th. Uh, it was just, uh, it was, this was her second Iron Woman match in two days, and it told a great story of perseverance throughout the whole thing and ended up with a really good singles match against uh, uh, Takashi Sasaki whose name escaped me for a sec. Uh, but yeah, overall, really fun match. Really good way to spend an hour plus. You almost Ryan Davidson to yourself there. I know. Uh, I watched a Ryan Davidson match. 
since our last oh. episode. I wow. watched his uh, match against uh, Shota from the reality of wrestling. And you know what? It was pretty good. Oh, in Texas. In Texas. Yeah. Um, you know what? They I got good the... production on that show. I, if I cared, I would watch it <laughs> more. But like, you know what? Don't really care now, about that scene. Did you watch it for Shota or did you watch it for Ryan Davidson? Ryan Davidson. Great. <laughs> and what'd you think? I thought it was good. He he looked good. Uh, he didn't look at all like I expected. I don't know why. I kind of expected him to be like a lanky guy, but no, he's he's a, oh, no. he's a he's a big boy. No, he's not good, lanky at all. Match. You're right. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, my number nine match was a very recent match: Miyu Yamashita versus Millie McKenzie from Tokyo Joshi's All Rise Cork and Hall Show on November twenty seventh. Uh, we just talked about it. If you want to hear more about that match, you can listen to our most recent episode before this one. Uh, but just a match I really loved, thought the crowd lifted it to another level, and one I definitely wanted to include on this list. Uh, my number nine is Mesa Ruga versus Yuna Mizumori from Gato Move's 10th anniversary show, Phoenix Rises, from back in September 15th. Uh, this was really the final match between these two. Uh, they were pretty, the two top stars from their generation of, uh, of Gato Move, and this was their, their big final clash before Yuna rode off into the sunset to go work other places. Uh, super emotional match. They really both put everything they had into it. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, easily, for me, the best Gato move match of the year. My number eight match, I talked about it earlier, what a good year Azumi had, and I think one of her peaks was Azumi versus Mei Saruga from the Stardom Cinderella Tournament Finals on April 29th, just the sort of peak of the style of match that Azumi had over and over this year. A lot of very good matches that are just outside of this top 10 for Azumi, but this Azumi Mesuruga match was the perfect sort of mesh of two opponents who are very similar and can wrestle very similar styles, really getting together an interesting match with Mace Ruga, not usually wrestling in stardom. So a little bit of a change of pace. And I thought that this was super fun and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that was a great match. I, that one just missed my list. Uh, my next match is what is it? Seven, eight. What are we on? This is eight. This is eight. Okay. Uh, my eighth match is Tom Nakano versus Natsupoi in their cage match from Fight to the Top from uh, June 26th. This was a brutal match. I think this if this had ended the feud, it would have been my number one feud of the year for sure. Uh, I loved this match. I, I wish it had blood, but I, I understand why it didn't, but it should have had blood. Uh, <laughs> incredible match, just a just violent fight between these two. Uh, I I loved it. Definitely one of the best of the year for sure. My number seven match, a match from all the way back in the beginning of January of this year, Mizuki taking on Miyu Yamashita at the Tokyo Joshi New Year Show on January fourth. A match I very much enjoyed, and it's almost a year ago, and I don't really remember that much about it. I completely uh, forgot this match ever happened, to be honest. Except I remember I really liked it um, and thought it was very good. And I don't know, maybe I would think differently if I rewatched it, knowing Mizuki didn't win the title at all in the whole mm. year. Um but a match that I thought was excellent. I thought the New Year's show was very good overall. I think earlier in the year, it was a contender for show of the year, as I'm sure this upcoming New Year's show will be for Tokyo Joshi. But this was another one. You know, I had the Millie McKenzie match, and now this match against Mizuki. 
and I have another match coming up, really the eye-opener when I talked about earlier, um, the eye-opener with Miyu Yamashita's year. This, another top 10 match for Miyu Yamashita, already two, and we're only four matches in. So <laughs> the proof is in the pudding, as they say. All right, my number seven is the high-speed title match between Azumi and Starlight Kid from Stardom Cinderella Journey in Nagaoka on uh, February 23rd. This is kind of like the ideal high-speed title match. Like, just, you picture this match in your head, that's what you're getting. That's exactly what it is, and it's awesome. Uh, the, just, it's it's everything you want it to be, and it's so good. I uh, love these two wrestlers, and they just have such great chemistry together. My number six match is also from Tokyo Joshi. It is Yuka Sakazaki versus Miyu Watanabe from the Tokyo Princess Cup Finals on August 14th. Uh, a match I love, the, the star-making weekend for Miyu Watanabe with the big fight here. This one slightly lower, as you'll see, than the other one, um, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, my number six is Siri versus Asuka from the Hanakamura Memorial Produce Show Bagus from uh, May 23rd. This was just an incredible cap to this show. Uh, these two, you, who you wouldn't normally see wrestle really uh just w where they work so this was a very cool matchup and they both delivered and it was awesome and i think this was my favorite Siri match of the year yeah looking at my notes yeah so yeah uh if you haven't seen it definitely check it out i, th I feel like this show kind of flew under the radar this year there wasn't as many people talking about it as there have been in previous years uh, but yeah, definitely go back and watch or rewatch uh, Siri versus Asuka. My number five match of the year, we're in the top five, is I just mentioned it. It is Miyu Watanabe versus Miyu Yamashita from the Tokyo Princess Cup semifinals on August 13th. One of my favorite matches of the year, obviously. Uh, but a match that was so great, the first match that sort of made Miyu Watanabe with the great storyline of Miyu sort of hanging on for dear life, trying to win the match, trying to overcome the ace of Tokyo Joshi and succeeding to go on to face Yuka Sakazaki the very next night. But a match that I just love, two excellent wrestlers, another feather in the cap for Miyu Yamashita on the year and really proof of Miyu Watanabe's great improvement, as we talked about earlier in the show. Uh, my number five is Julia versus Suzu Suzuki from the Five Star Grand Prix 2022 Night 20 Championship Battle uh, from October 1st. Uh, this was exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, these two... Just had an incredible match, just super emotional, super hard hitting, uh, and I and it left me wanting more, which in the best way possible. Like, just give me matches with these two forever. Uh, it's so good. This is my second favorite ma uh, start a match of the year. My number four match, a match that earlier in the year was in my top three matches, but just slid out, just beaten out very slightly, is the Magical Sugar Rabbits defending their tag titles against the great team of Free Wi-Fi from Tokyo Joshi Yes Wonderland on May 3rd. I think I was the high man on this match all around uh just a match that totally clicked with me thought it was the highlight of the magical sugar rabbits uh title 2022 title reign and a great showcase for the up and coming team of free wi-fi just two teams that really clicked really felt intense with um yuka and mizuki sort of taking on that 
I think as we talked about on the show, that Tanahashi like heel uh, turn, quote unquote, which really gave this match a great edge. And I really loved it. Was that the match where uh, now smacked your head on the ring post and it made that really gross noise? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that was a good one. That one, I I I forgot about that match until just now, but yeah, no, that match rocked. Uh, my number four is something I had to rewatch yesterday to remember, and hey, guess what? It still rules. Uh, Regina Du Wave title match: Hikaru Shida versus Suzu Suzuki from the Wave fifteenth anniversary Carnival Wave Evening Show on August fourteenth. Uh, yeah, this rules. Uh, it's pretty much. Joshi present versus Joshi future with uh, Shida versus Suzu, just in terms of where they're at in their careers. Uh, I really loved this match. They fought so hard against each other and threw bombs the entire time. Uh, It was awesome. Definitely go back and watch it if you haven't. Uh, I mean, I know when I started saying Regina Duwe have titled Hakaru Shida, you definitely expected the verses to be against the bunny. But, you know, just didn't didn't make the list. Yeah, unfortunately, we've been denied um, an opportunity to have the 2023 best match of the year be 10. The Bunny Regina <laughs> DeWave title defenses. Um, <laughs> so sadly, yeah. um, but maybe I was really I have to say. I was sort of rooting for the bunny because I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to see the chaos. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to see it, but Karashita retained the title. So that is, uh, a great pick. And now we are in the top three match of the year. My number three, one, I know Kelly vehemently disagrees with. Mm -mm, Don't like it. This is Hayek Kamatani versus Starlight Kid from Stardom Midsummer Champions on July 9th, a match that I went four and three quarter star on. Uh, we talked a lot about earlier about Saya Kamatani, but this was the one match I thought of her year. Um, I think largely thanks to Starlight Kid, where Everything really came together. I thought it was an awesome match. I thought Starlight Kid sort of reigned in the worst of Sayakamatani's habits and really put together something that was uh, really good and I very much enjoyed. So that was my number three match of the year. All right. My number three match of the year is also my number one starter match of the year. Uh, this is the IWGP women's title match between Kairi and Mayu Iwatani from New Japan slash Stardom Historic Crossover on November 20th. Uh, this the, the two pillars of Stardom going at it, and it was just as emotional and as much of a spectacle as you would expect between these two. Uh, it's a very good match. I expect this match to end up pretty high on a lot of match of the year lists and yeah a really incredible kickoff to the iwgp women's title lineage here so yeah definitely definitely my favorite stardom match of the year my number two match of the year was also a stardom match it was the previously mentioned by kelly starlight kid versus azumi from stardom cinderella journey in nagaoka on february 23rd a match between arguably my two favorite wrestlers in all of stardom delivering the exact match that i knew they could deliver and You can go back and listen to our review of the show where I talked about they're the two best wrestlers. They went out, they wrestled a crazy um, match. You know, Kelly mentioned that there really wasn't any big sort of standout match of the year. I think had this match been wrestled in something like September or October, I think this would have been that big match of the year. I think it sort of has gotten lost in some of it is just the sheer volume of stardom 
shows and stardom matches. And some of it is sort of the natural way that things that happen in the first half of the year oftentimes sort of get buried by the things that happen in the second half of the year in all of wrestling and all of these sort of awards. But I think that this was just for me, the sort of ideal, perfect stardom style match. And I loved it. I went four and three quarters and it is my number two match of the year. Well, I also think something that hurt it in terms of like widespread match of the year, kind of people rallying around it is it's the high speed title. And I feel like a lot of people don't treat that as a high level title. So they don't really think of it in terms of that, where it's like, is if that same exact match was just for the main stardom title, it would have, I think it would be higher up on a lot of lists. Well, I think it's sort of got the typical type of promotion that like the quote unquote Joshi match of the year gets, which is like Meltzer tweeted about it. Will Ospreay tweeted about it. like people outside of the circle of Joshi are like, hey, everyone, check out this match, which is often what happens with sort of the big matches. I think it being for the high speed could be. But I think in terms of attracting non-Joshi people to be like, here's the one Joshi match from this year you have to watch. I don't know that they really are like, oh, but it's for the high speed title. Like, I don't care about that. I think of all, and we had many, 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 many episodes ago when we had some Q&A stuff. um, I remember someone asked about you know, what does it take to have a Joshi match of the year? And I think the stuff happening in the second half of the year is incredibly valuable for non Joshi people because to go now and be like, Hey, Starlight Kid Nozumi had a match. It happened 11 months ago. They're like, Oh, I don't know. (laughs) Like, and looking at the record, like the Voices of Wrestling match of the year stuff, I think every Joshi match that, you know, the years when it was like, oh, the top one is 35 and now it's 22 and now it's eight. I think last year was the first time in my recollection where the top Joshi match took place in the first half of the year. I think. Yeah, that Um, sounds right. Someone can fact check me on that, but. It's just one of those things where, and I think this is the case for all wrestling, when people are going back at the end of the year and saying, give me things to watch. I need things to watch. Things from farther away feel less important, I think, Mm -hmm. sort of psychologically. So when you're like, hey, watch this match from February, it's like, oh, this is from like a long time ago. Um, So I think that's probably the thing that, heard it most because in the moment it felt like a big thing where people were like hey where do i see this match oh i'm hearing a lot about this match but i think it's one of those things where if you can get it late enough people might go oh yeah i can slide that into my top 10 where if it was on someone's top 10 a non-joshi person's top 10 six months ago they may have eight matches where they're like, oh, I'd rather have this on my list because this is the style of wrestling I like. Where in the back half of the year, they'll just be like, sure, I'll throw that on my top 10. And then there's nothing else to supersede it. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll, We'll have to see. I think it's the first year where I'm interested to see there doesn't feel like one match where I'm like, yep, this is going to be, you know, last year it was Utami Shuri was the match that it was like, this is going to be the top voted match of the year. I don't know that there's one this year. As you you said, as you said, where I'm like, it'll be this. It could be Siri versus Julia from what is the 29th? It could be, although, is that too late? That's the thing, I don't know. Where people are like, ah, it's the 29th, everyone's doing holiday stuff, and they're like, I'm too busy to watch this show in the next two days before I solidify my votes. Yeah. 
So yeah, it it could be, but yeah, you're right. It might be too late too. I mean, that match also has to be really good and sort of peak above a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So we'll see. Speaking of a lot of other stuff, here's my number two. <laughs> uh, I went with the Sendai Girls World Title match between Chihiro Hashimoto and Asuka from the Shenjo Chronicle on uh, July 10th. This match is incredible. Going back and rewatching it yesterday, I was really just blown away by it, how good it was. These two are just throwing bombs the entire match and just taking wild bumps. Like it's such a great match, just hard hitting. Both are giving everything they have. Like it rocks and like I said earlier, I this is this is what pushed me to put Asuka in my as my wrestler of the year. Uh, just incredible work here. Defi- it, I feel like this match has really flown under the radar. So definitely go back and give this one a watch before you finalize your match of the year list. And finally, we have reached the top of the mountain. The number one match of the year. The best match of the year. My pick from Stardom Fight Uh, Fight in the top from June 26th, my only, my one and only five-star match of the year, Tom Nakano versus Natsupoi in the cage, Uh, my runaway pick for the best match of the year, just exactly my type of match. Kelly, I know you mentioned you wish they had had some blood, which would have been nice, but I just thought it was overall a really tough fight. It felt like a fight. And it was exactly my type of wrestling, really tough, really going at it, not holding back in the cage, which I thought was really fun. Something that they don't um, really do in stardom. They had the main event in the cage, but that was after this. So just overall, all the sort of aspects of it coming together for a match that I went an easy five stars on and is my number one match of the year. Uh, my number one comes to us from Tokyo Joshi. Uh, it is Yuka Sakazaki versus Mio Watanabe in the Tokyo Princess Cup Finals from August 14th. I l- absolutely love the story of this match, of just Mio fighting as hard as she can against the unstoppable force that is Yuka Sakazaki. Uh, when we first talked about this match on the show, I think I said this it felt like Yuka was the Terminator here and just this unfeeling, uncaring, unstoppable monster that was going to take out Miyu. And because Miyu just, she can't make it to the top of the mountain if she doesn't beat Yuka. And Yuka's just this force of nature who, she's the gatekeeper. And you know what? Miyu wasn't strong enough and she'll come back next year and try again. And hopefully maybe next year she'll be able to pull it off. But I just, I loved the story here. I loved the emotion. I loved the post-match. Uh, just an incredible match for me. This was for sure my number one Joshi match of the year. So that was our matches of the year. And now I will lay out as Kelly presents the final award of the episode. All right. I know you guys were all waiting for it. It is time for the 69th annual annual, not animal annual Rossi Ogawa Memorial award for coolest boobs. So there was a little bit of controversy this year. We were going to have one winner and then someone stepped in and said, no, you can't do this. So the winner of the award for the 69th year in a row. Hoshi Tango. Obviously, look at those. But here, let me tell you, let me let me give you a little peek behind the curtain of the politics going on here. The committee had initially voted for Chan Yoda. Fantastic choice. Who can who can disagree? Look at Rossi. Look at that ride she gave him. He was having a great time. Obviously, that's who he's going to vote for. But the higher ups at Bushi Road stepped in and said, "No, no, no, we're not doing this. She's not winning. She's not a part of all of this, Rossi. I'm sorry, it can't happen." 
And you know what, Bushy Road? You can't take this from us. I'm I'm calling it right now. I've talked to John Moxley. We have both agreed. The award for coolest boobs goes to Chan Yoda. She did it, everyone. Round of applause. Um so I have a question. Yes. Um Hoshitango is fifty seven years old. So yeah. is the implication that he's won this sixty eight times that he was winning it prior to his conception? Cool boobs are just they go outside the realms of space and time. <laughs> okay. Th- I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to say before we give our final farewell of the year, just as a note, um, in two weeks, we will not have an episode. So this is our final episode for 2022, but we will be back in 2023. Uh, But before we go and give our final thoughts, I want to thank everyone who has listened to the podcast, who has listened to the podcast in 2022 who has reached out to us on Twitter or reached out to us in the voices of wrestling discord about the show compliments, complaints, questions, concerns, any of that. We very much appreciate uh, you listening along with this very silly show. And Kelly, thank you uh, for being here as well. I've had a great time and I look forward to more great times in 2023. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. I love hosting the show. Uh, it's always a fun time and uh, love all our little gremlins in the discord. I don't really do much in there, but I lurk. I see what you're posting. And uh, I guess big ups to all our haters, too. Kelly, do you have any final uh, movie review of 2022? Not really. Um, I saw the the fourth Evangelion movie in theaters the other day. That was fun. Uh, I guess I guess I could leave us on a quick little story. I went to a Christmas party last night, and uh, I don't know. I'm too old for this shit. Me and my friends were just hanging out in the basement while everyone was getting rowdy upstairs. Uh, and then uh, 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 some inebriated people came downstairs into the basement and trapped us into a game of Never Have I Ever. And you know what? You you want to guess what I what I thought of what my never have I ever was, Taylor? Do I want to guess what your never have I ever was? Because I couldn't think of anything. Couldn't it just this is what came to mind first. I said, never have I ever fucked my dad. <laughs> okay, well, I thought ending on the talk of boobs transcending time and space was. <laughs> Uh, a way to end the episode but i guess that will be the way to end the episode um glad to hear that that is the case i guess yeah um in good news but anyway that is all for us for 2022 we will see you in 2023 for kelly i am taylor saying farewell happy holidays everybody see you next year The JCPenney Mystery Sale is back for the holidays. Through Thursday, usher in huge holiday savings with our in-store coupon giveaway. You can get an extra 30, 40, or even 50% off while they last. Simply find an associate for a coupon, then peel to reveal your deal. Hurry in now to discover the savings you've been wishing for. We got your holiday. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 1215. Exclusion supply. Giveaway in-store only. Must be 18 years or older. See store for details. The Venture X Card from Capital One gives you more of what you love, like premium travel benefits and access to Taylor Swift tickets. Ooh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and 10 times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. Plus, get access to Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Maybe I'll see you there. The Venture X Card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details.